Hello, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for your joining today's webinar. This is a combined APOA Hand and Upper Limb Society and Trauma Society webinar. And today we called very important faculty members from APOA societies to answer very important questions of upper limb uh, trauma. This is the first combined meeting between a hand and upper limb society and trauma society. And we are very happy to share our experience and the wisdom with you all with the APOA members. So before any delay, I would like to uh, have a, a short introduction how we are going to uh, have this webinar today. Next slide, please. The total webinar is 90 minutes and first session, shoulder, next elbow and third hand and wrist section. And the webinar is going to be 10 to 10 minutes talk and another uh, 20 minutes Q and A. So if you have any questions, leave your questions. And I would like to introduce our Dr. Anup from a trauma society. Dr. Anup, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, you know, very warm welcome to this another exciting webinar from Asia Pacific Trauma Society and Hand Society. We have galaxy of speakers today and this is going to be a case-based discussions. All the delegates are requested to put in their uh, questions into a QN box and uh, moderators will take up the questions to the panelists. And uh, I'm sure that we all are going to learn a lot from our uh, esteemed speakers today. Thank you, Eno. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'd like to share a few things before we start the webinar. First, you can find a Q&A box in your, uh, in your uh, screen and please use your Q&A box so that we can answer your questions. And moderators will collect all the questions to answer you so that this is going to be really interactive. And the last, the certificate of attendance will be given to you once you finish your post webinar survey at the end of our webinar. So before any delay, I would like to introduce our first moderator to you. Shoulder section, Dr. Wendy, please. Good evening. Uh, this is uh, Randy Bindra from the Gold Coast, Australia. Uh, and uh, with me, um, co-moderating today is Dr. Prasit, uh, Wangi Ratna Chai. Hi, everybody. I'm from Thailand. So, without any further delay, I'll ask the first speaker, Dr. Saeed Al Thani, to uh, give us a 10 minute uh, presentation on four part shoulder fractures, the place of fixation, 
total and reverse arthroplasty. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, so when we talk about uh, for heart uh, shoulder fracture, we need to learn when we uh, indicate uh, it's a type of uh, surgical intervention, and also when to indicate an internal fixation and uh, arthroplasty, and what uh, to expect as an outcome. Shoulder has a unique uh, problem. It has an anatomy, which is a complex between bone and rotator cuff, and also classification is some sort of difficult, not straightforward, like most of the other uh, fractures. And uh, vascularity is an issue here with the potential of avascular necrosis. Are we dealing with the same uh, fracture across age? I think no, because we have two different uh, pathology. We have elderly patient and we have young patient. Young patient, it's high force energy. They have good bone stock. They are fine, uh, high functional demands. We need to restore their function. We need to preserve the head. Uh, we need to get them back to, to their activity level. Elderly, they have a, they come with its own package, lower bone, uh, low functional demand. What we aiming from their treatment is elevate the pain and restore function. So when you look at the function is important for both, depends on their level but also uh, demand is different. How we decide to do an RIF or arthroplasty? There's multiple factors, uh, fracture configuration, bone quality, age, uh, hand dominant is a plus or minus, activity level, and general health of the patient. So when we look at this young uh, patient with this uh, convoluted fracture, but it's a bulbous impact, and we did an upper reduction, internal fixation, which is, uh, was successful, especially when we use an angular stabilized plate. Uh, we can augment it with a suture to repair uh, the tuberosity with the cuff. And when we look at the uh, multiple study, this is a recent study in the injury with meta analysis, uh, which shows that RAF has a high improvement and DASH and VAS score, uh, although it has, it is a complication like a, a percentage of redo when it failed. Why it failed? We have different reason for failure. Blood supply is one of them, avascular necrosis. As we know, if you go back to the anatomy, uh, we know that the posterior circumflex contribute to about 64%. That's why we need to watch for the posterior medial calcar and uh, to look at, at that with the CT scan to see our anatomy prior to fixation. Again, uh, Hertal uh, criteria for uh, avascular process shows that these uh, figures will have a 97% risk of AVN. Uh, calcar less than eight millimeter intact to the head and fracture through the anatomical neck, as well as a medial hinge disruption, which is again, uh, the posterior medial. When to consider uh, forward? Again, if you look from what I mentioned earlier, calcar intact uh, can be reconstructed, tuberosity can be repaired, bone quality that's amenable for healing, uh, and all preserve the posterior medial soft tissue. And choosing the right approach also where you can preserve the blood supply to the head like a minimally invasive uh, approach might help also in preserving the blood supply to the uh, fracture site. When to consider arthroplasty, if you look at this, this is severely osteoporotic. Uh, it's not gonna, um, the head is empty. so. Elderly with osteoporotic with a calcar broken and low demand, multiple comorbidity, maybe it's easier to go with arthroplasty and uh, move on with their uh, function. What type of arthroplasty we choose? We 
look at different implant, hemi, total, and reverse. Uh, when we look at the hemi and uh, total, they have good for pain relief, function similar to the RAF and uh, non-operative when it comes to the uh, pain and function also, both treatment. Uh, it is poor functional result when it comes to the younger uh, patient. Uh, this is Sperling in 1999. Although at this time, uh, the, maybe the only indication for hemi when we have uh, commuted uh, head splitting uh, fracture in uh, younger patient where we cannot uh, repair or uh, fix. Uh, if you look at this, 32 years old, when the fracture is, uh, the head is, is completely destroyed the head. And uh, here we can do hemiarthroplasty for this patient. So what is the issue with hemiarthroplasty and the shoulder? Function recovery is unpredictable due to the rotator cuff. And if you look, uh, look at the pictures on the right, there is a complete of the rotator cuff. Also the fibrosity migration, uh, when mild position 50%, which uh, leads them with poor outcome. And uh, difficult to revision, especially if you use uh, a non-modular implant where you cannot uh, com uh, convert it to a reverse each. The This picture here, uh, this is from a 29 years old lady who had a convulsion and it was fixed with the uh, hemiarthroplasty, and you can see the tuberosity wasn't here, probably. Then reverse uh, shoulder arthroplasty became the holy grail for all the fractures related to forepart in elderly, uh, especially with their calcar disruption or tuberosis, uh, tuberosity in an union, or poor general health that can sustain only one and fast surgery. Advantage, it's a predictable for pain relief and function. And uh, complication is uh, reduced now with the lateralized uh, reverse shoulder arthroplastic design. And you can see from the studies by torture uh, with the meta-analysis, the study shows a constant score and AS is, is improving. And also it has a less complication rate. Uh, the second question, does the tuberosity or manual or resorption impact the result. Uh, Van Helman shows in a recent paper with the Journal of Shoulder and Medical Surgery, shows a 41 uh, patient with the reverse tuberosity position. The strength is uh, five out of five in 41 patient. And forward elevation is very good with the range of motion and the score is also improved. Hemiotheroblasty and reverse, this is another comparison study by Sebastian for Kade, it shows that double blind uh, reverse, uh, sorry, randomized control study shows that uh, reverse has much better uh, outcome and function uh, for the patient. Again, this is another meta analysis shows that hemiarthroplasty compared to reverse has a worse pain and function score and increased risk of rehabilitation. So in summary, uh, we have uh, a four-part uh, proximal humerus uh, fracture uh, has a best single surgery for the patient is the goal, and RAF intact calcar, good bone quality, and active patient. Hemiarthroplasty can be considered on the young patient with fixable, uh, sorry, unfixable fracture better, and reverse an elderly osteoporotic and uh, torn calf. Well, uh, I will show you one, uh, we have one minute, so we can show you, uh, this is a 52, 54 years old, who was intoxicated and fractured both shoulder. This is his right shoulder. And you can see uh, the head is split. And while uh, we fix it with the doctor approach, uh, with the vulgarly impacted head. And while we operate, we notice that he's uh, also have a problem in the other shoulder, which was missed. So we did the CT scan and it shows again that the head is splitted. Um, so we take him back uh, day and we 
that uh, lateral split with the maple technique. Uh, you can see the head is uh, split it completely. We reduce it and we try to fix it. When you look at the pictures, the picture for the left shoulder is much better than the right. But uh, when it comes to a year later, we can see that because we know it's a head split. Uh, it has a high risk of AVN and uh, you can see that the screws been created through the, the head in the on the right, uh, sorry, in the left compared to well healed uh, head on the on the left. So is the shoulder is not a weight bearing joint, is the AVN is a problem. At least you restore his uh, bone. So uh, in summary, this is new approach. We keep the fracture aligned together and maintain the biology. If it's not reduced in the hour, it will not reduce later. And shoulder fracture dissociation is a high risk for avascular necrosis, especially with the head split fracture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Altani. I had one uh, quick question from one of the audience members. They were asked in a comminuted four part fracture, does age decide if we have to go for arthroplasty or is it only the fracture pattern? Were you able to hear the question, Dr. Altani? I think no. You couldn't hear the question? Randy, can we uh, collect all Q&A at the end of second talk? Let's do that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Altani. Uh, I think we will move on to the next topic. Uh, talk about if the fixation or the replacement is failed, what to do next? Uh, next speaker, uh, he finished a clinical fellow in shoulder and elbow surgery from the orthopedic department, Asan University. Uh, please welcome uh, Professor Ashi from Mumbai, India, please. I need to share my screen, yeah, thank you. Yeah. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Ashay Kekatpure. Uh, I'm very grateful to Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association for giving me this opportunity to discuss a not so common uh, scenario where uh, in spite of our best uh, uh, reasons and intentions, uh, we'll end up in a situation where our uh, nicely done surgeries fail. So I come from India. Uh, uh, to be precise, I come from the very center of India. Uh, we have got a geometrical, I mean, the zero mile in India. This is Nagpur, where I am uh, an associate professor in a university here, along with my own private practice. So, uh, as uh, Professor Altani has rightly pointed out, the right patient and the right surgery is mandatory for your uh, selection in a four part and a given situation. And patient factors, they matter a lot uh, whenever you are doing a proximal humerus. But uh, in spite of all these intentions, sometimes the osteosynthesis and orthoplasty doesn't go the way we have planned it. Uh, but I would like to say that not all failures are created equal. When I say this, you know, what I mean is that uh, there are failures which were avoidable and uh, there are circumstances which were unavoidable. So in spite of a nicely done surgery, if the patient uh, factors don't allow, and your osteosynthesis fails, that is under uh, some of the unavoidable circumstances or complex scenarios. So we have to have to have some strategies for learning from these failures and need to ask the pertinent questions as why uh, and how this particular implant or processes have failed. And we need to base our uh, strategies and learning from these uh, cases and develop a basic tenet as to manage the patient and give whatever is the best for uh, the patient. And therefore, we can make some sense or some order of this chaotic situation of a failed primary surgery or a failed primary osteo, uh, uh, osteosynthesis. So, uh, as I said, the, the primary tenet is that uh, primarily we have to balance or make a balance between the patient expectations and available resources. Now, available resources, because I come from India, we are a developing nation of 100, uh, 1 billion, 1.2 billion people. Uh, we have scarcity of resources, so we have to give or deliver the best possible, scenario, best possible case scenario in a failed implant to a patient who cannot afford uh, even a, a single surgery. So we have to understand the spectrum or reason for failure. 
So whether it is the implant which has only failed, which is slightly a easier scenario to deal with if, the, if there is no uh, uh, side by infection or the patient factors are pretty reasonable and they are on your side, or is there a triology where the implant has failed with an infection with a comorbidity of patient factors? So I'm going to present three different cases where we, have, we are going to see uh, each scenario of failure, like whether the implant has only failed, whether there is an implant with infection and whether the patient factors are involved. So, without, so what are the options once we come across these situations? So we have got a huge amount of literature talking about revision osteosynthesis, orthoplasty, single stage revision of orthoplasty, two stage revision of orthoplasty, use of prostolac fusion and excision orthoplasty. So we are going to consider three different scenarios and let us see uh, uh, whether we have done justice in our cases. So this is case one. This is 11 months old proximal humerus fracture. He was nicely fixed in the, in, uh, in the initial surgery, but sustained another fall. So this was unavoidable complex scenario as we have seen. So the case of a broken implant. So it was a pretty straightforward a day to day occurrence uh, in a setup which we work. We have to remove the implant. Go ahead. Uh, it was an implant failure without any infection and the patient was fairly young. So we went ahead, put a bone graft, did a revision surgery, put the black in on osteosynthesis and it is a pleasurable day in the OR. When you able to see after this, when you are able to see this, at the end of a surgery in this particular fracture. So the patient went on and healed well. So this is, uh, this is a case scenario where only of the situation with proper planning uh, with a bone graft and a revision osteosynthesis. A case two, a slightly complex scenario where we have a 52 year gentleman operated two years back with a, for a proximal humerus. Uh, he's a tailor by occupation. And as uh, Dr. Altani has pointed out that the uh, posterior circumflex, if it is compromised, is result into AVN. So he had AVN with screws protruding inside the shoulder and painful range of movement in all activities of daily living. So we went ahead. And in this particular case, there was uh, no issue of affordability. He was able to afford a revision surgery and a expensive prosthesis. So we were able to put a reverse. So we had a satisfactory outcome in this particular case. Now let us increase slightly complexity and add the other two factors of infection and a patient morbidity. So a 54 year old gentleman operated for a proximal humerus fracture presented with a discharging sinus for three months with implant in situ. So what do we do? What do we do in this case? So the available options were, and he was a farmer by occupation, a laborer, who can't afford a revision surgery or revision multiple surgeries. So here, everything was done right, still in spite of that infection and an implant failure. This was his pre-operative passive range of movement. Flexion was limited to 45 degrees, extension to 10 degrees. He couldn't do his activities of daily living. So we thought we were smart. We would put a stage one cement spacer with a mold, but it is not available in India and there are serious cost issues. So. Uh, there is a, a, a facility of a 3D printing. We got a CT scan of the opposite shoulder. We molded it with the help of our dental uh, guys and we created a mold which was indigenous. And then we implanted the prostolac based on a, a, a ten snail. And these are his immediate post-operative passive range of movement. Flexion was zero to 150 degrees. Extension was zero to 50 degrees. External rotation was up to 90 degrees. And this is his post two years follow-up. Now, we have taken a proper consent of revision or revising it to a, a, a stabler implant, but the patient doesn't want the removal of his prostolac. He's back to his all farming activities. He is using the trick movement of his uh, uh, scapula for doing his activities, but he is happy. Now, why prostolac? Why prostolac? Uh, this is a very widely published study and a uh, uh, usage of uh, prostolac antibiotic rotate acrylic cement uh, for the treatment of infection of a shoulder orthoplasty by John J.P. Warner from the Boston uh, group. And uh, they are saying that prostolac works because it maintains the appropriate periarticular soft tissue tension, preventing capsular ligamentous contracture, also leading high local concentration of antibiotics. At the same time, there has been some reports of, of uh, osteolysis, but it works in scenario. Shoulder uh, being a non weight bearing joint, it can definitely help uh, uh, with continuation or retention of this prostolac. Uh, so these are the indigenous mold created by, the, by that group. 
and they are good for two stage revision surgeries in case they experience uh, ortho uh, infection after the uh, primary infect uh, primary orthoplasty but we were able to extend or extrapolate this use in a failed osteosynthesis so this is a case 3 where uh, everything was done right the, I mean, according to the surgeon, it failed. The primary surgery failed. He went ahead and he did a revision with a hemiorthoplasty device, which also failed. And the patient came with pain and infection. And there was a discharging sinus. So another farmer by occupation, a lady, a frail old lady, implants not available. So we went ahead and did an excision orthoplasty. And this is his, her six months results. And this is the 18 months follow up. So she is at least able to carry out her activities of daily living and able to do her work with the available resources which she had at her disposal. She's able to continue her life, day to day activities. So, take home message we need to understand. In the case of a failed osteosynthesis, what is the bacteria, the patient, the type of infection, local soft tissue, and most importantly, the surgeon and the resources which are available to us and deliver what is the best possible uh, uh, thing uh, for that patient. So take home message, we need to get it right the first time. We need to learn from our failure. Prostolac is a viable option in shoulder in a cost-constrained scenario and excision orthoplasty serves well in well-indicated patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Professor Ashi. Uh, the next uh, 20 minutes is for the question and answer. Uh, Professor Landy, please, uh, please uh, ask again about the previous. Yeah. Yep, thank you. So one of, the, uh, one of the questions was in a young person, is it purely the, in a four part fracture, is it the fracture pattern or the age that determines whether you will do an arthroplasty. What's your feeling, Dr. Altani? Well, I think uh, if you look, it's multiple factors that contribute into the decision. It is the fracture pattern, fixable or not. For a young man I will, or a woman, I will, uh, I will give an uh, attempt of fixation uh, all the time. Uh, uh, even if it goes to AVN, uh, that can be dealt with uh, later with uh, with some sort of arthroplasty. Or if it's not, uh, it, this is what I said early, shoulder is not a weight-bearing joint. You can get away with things in the shoulder, like this lady that uh, was shown without a uh, humeral head that she's able to function. And uh, I had a couple of patients that uh, get infected uh, after a reverse and uh, severely osteoporotic. So the upper 10 centimeter of, the, of her humerus is not there. And she didn't require any revision for the last 10 years. She's functioning very well. And she's yeah. happy with her activity. And uh, so uh, she doesn't want to have any surgery. So you can get away with a lot in the shoulder. The bottom line for young men, you have to, uh, you have to give them a chance of fixing. Uh, and if it's not failed, then you can look after that later on. But I will, it's multifactorial. It's not one factor only. Okay. Uh, Professor Altani, I think uh, another question is connected to the first one. Uh, yes. Somebody uh, wondering that, uh, how about the hotel classification? Is it uh, still a good uh, prognosis for the AVN right now or not? Yeah. Well, it is uh, give you some clue, but it's not uh, formally predictive. The reduction of the fracture is more important uh, than just the criteria. It gives you some clue, but I will not uh, use it 100%. Mm -hmm. okay. Ashe, uh, do you feel... Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Ashe, yes. uh, Ashe. some of the questions, uh, a couple of questions, similar theme. They want to know, is the greater trochanter critical? Is the head critical in getting things lined up correctly when you're doing an internal fixation of a four part? Well, it is like a Lego. 
you have to put the puzzle where uh, you have to reconstruct the least uh, commuted site and you build up the block uh, belong to that. And uh, I find that uh, uh, using lateral approach for this, preserve my blood supply and dissection uh, when it comes from the uh, subscapularis as well as from the infraspinatus uh, posteriorly. So I can go directly to this fracture and I can do minimal tweaking to reduce it back without doing a major dissection uh, by doing the delta pectoral, although that can be uh, a surgeon preference, but uh, trying to minimize the soft tissue uh, dissection. Dr. Kekatpure, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, as Dr. Altani has pointed out very nicely for a revision for avoiding that AV and we need to be very meticulous with our dissection. But uh, I mean, of course, it is a certain preference. It's a delta pectoral approach, which I usually and mostly use. Uh, second thing is that if, uh, I mean, as I pointed out in the first case of the broken implant, or so you need to be ready with the uh, a bone graft for the possibility of use of a bone graft. There is a question, I think, which asks whether the use of a strut or a bone graft, which is necessary uh, for elevating the head, for getting the right, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, the puzzle uh, together, we need uh, the greater tuberosity at that particular level, slightly about a centimeter and a half lower than the head. Then only then we will be able to get the abduction properly. And of course, the parachute sutures, uh, those, they, they, they really help us uh, getting our fracture uh, together in a four-part case. So you consent your patient for a strut, you mean like from the iliac crest or fibula? What is your preferred choice or do you use allograft? No, we, use, uh, we don't use allograft. I consent them for a fibula strut most of the times as well as iliac crest. I use uh, uh, kind of I use allograft. Uh, all the time, I don't like the second site morbidity. Uh, I use it as uh, different. I use it as a strut uh, to build up the, especially an osteoporotic patient, uh, especially in two part uh, when you can, you need some good fixation for your screws. Uh, if it is, I need to fill the, the, the cavity, I use some uh, bone substitute with the bone chip to fill uh, and back that crunched uh, cancellous bone from the fracture to fill the defect and keep the head uh, elevated. Like to go into, uh, yeah, elevated. Mm -hmm. And I use uh, some K wires initially to keep the height while I'm making a window uh, or the fracture cause the window for me to fill it with the bone, bone it will be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, for uh, both professor, uh, if we decide to do the fixation for the humeral fracture, uh, what is different between the IM nail or the locking plate? So can I can I take this question? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, if we decide to do the fixation of the fracture, any issue yeah. that that you will think is should be the IM nail or the locking plate for the fixation of I mean, the proximal nail fracture. Yeah, IM nail uh, sometimes, I mean, there is a well, very well recorded study by AO group also uh, that it is uh, the chances of a revision or a failure uh, are higher with the uh, intramedullary nail as compared to a fellows plate. Uh, fellows, of course, it is a technically slightly demanding but uh, in a well-executed uh, fillers fixation, a four-part fracture will behave uh, very, very predictably. Uh, if the tuberosities are, uh, the suturing is done right, if you have taken a proper control of your tuberosities, then I think uh, a fillers plate is a better implant. This is just my, uh, can I say? Well, uh, well I, I agree. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's okay, although there's a, a nailer who would uh, do uh, a better job with the nail, but in my hand, I think uh, I'm more control uh, on the fragment uh, with, the, with the blades. I can have good fixation. The problem with the nail, it, will, uh, it has two or three screws in the head. It might not capture the fragment properly. It might toggle around it. It will not give that uh, proper fixation, although that's debatable. Uh, the, there's... Uh, 
a very good surgeon who will do a nice job uh, with the with the nail. There is another but technique which is uh, coming up from the UK group. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I think I. You can do a hybrid, on, hybrid fixation. There is a uh, the palm tree technique which is being very much popularized. You can use a J wire fixation for elevation of that uh, depressed head, and you can use a phyllose plate uh, to supplement that J wires. That uh, is a hybrid technique which can be used in a in a parotic patient, where uh, uh, I mean there is how can I say is a golden mean, but intramedullary nail per se, I mean I think it is very much debatable. What do you say, Doctor Binder? Yeah, no, I I agree. I think this hybrid fixation is uh, is an interesting technique. Uh, we have used a one third tubular plate sometimes inside yeah. the medullary cavity with an external plate instead of a fibular strut. In an yes. acute fracture, it, it's an option as well. Uh, you know, the million dollar question, and somebody has put this is, what is your definition of elderly patient? And that is a moving target. So yeah. <laughs> well, uh, WHO said that the youth age is until 65, and I go with that. So, uh, okay. but when it comes to the question, I think it's a functional. If uh -huh. somebody who's uh, severely osteoporotic, uh, even if his age is 50 and he's uh, severely osteoporotic like an 80, I will treat him like an 80. It's a functional age as well, not just by number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, Ashe, how about uh, in your practice, what is the cut case that you will do the fixation or the atroplasty? Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I didn't get it. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, the same what question. The, the same yeah, question. Yeah, elderly for you, yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, 62. <laughs> I mean, 62. Uh, arbitrary, arbitrary uh, pointing out, like uh, as uh, Dr. Altani has said, more of a functional thing. Yeah. You, uh, we see farmers 60, 62, 74 years of age, functioning very mm -hmm. well chronologically, much uh, advanced in age, but very much younger, good bone strut. I will go ahead with fixation. I, my eldest, said, my eldest patient that I did an RAF for uh, for Bart, uh, it wasn't that displaced, but she was eighty five. Okay. Good bone stock, I guess. She has very good bone stock, and, uh, yeah. and when you have good bone stock, you have good bone stock. Okay. Yeah. So Asha, there's a question here. What would be the the minimum time interval or safe interval between your cement spacer? And you're putting a definitive implant. And if you can just give us a little more detail on, you know, when you take your implant out, what cultures do you do? When do you decide the patient is infection free and you're ready to move on to the next step? Okay. Uh, thank you for this question. This is very important. Uh, the defined time, I mean, for getting my spacer out, it has been, uh, we have learned a lot from our hip and knee colleagues that the cement keeps on eluting, say around two months to two and a half months. The, uh, the cement keeps on eluting the antibiotic for two, two and a half months. And after that, it only acts as a spacer. For taking out that, I would do a repeat uh, ESR and CRP. And if the levels, if the ESR is uh, less than uh, 20 and the CRP levels are less than 10, then only then I would consider uh, uh, with some doubt uh, that the patient has uh, 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 become infection free. But we are dealing with shoulder. We are we have the most common bacteria is uh, P. acini, which is a slow growing bacteria. So even if I'm doing my spacer removal, I will warn or to tell the patient or taking proper consent that we may need to do a re uh, uh, surgery. And I will send a, a, a sample at the time of the surgery uh, 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 for a gram stain. Uh, 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 and a frozen section. If I see that uh, the number of uh, uh, polymorphs are less than 10 per uh, high power field, then only then I would consider the patient free intraoperatively. If I've got no cultural growth when I'm doing my primary surgery, when I'm putting the spacer inside uh, for uh, one more time, then only then uh, I would consider the patient as uh, infection free and I would go ahead and remove it. Uh, another question for Professor Ashe, uh, is there any role of the arthrodesis for the case in your practice? See, for, for getting a good arthrodesis, there should be no infection. 
first and foremost, I have yeah, done for the case that is maybe fail from from yeah. uh, do the atropasty or so, and uh, also have the a, infection yet, right? Yeah, yeah. So there is definitely role of fusion, but I have I have no experience with fusion per se, and uh, whatever I have exhibited are uh, my cases in the last few years, and uh, I have not come across a scenario where I had to had a fusion done, but uh, let's see. But there is a definitive role of a fusion okay. uh, in a well indicated patient when there is no infection per se in a failed surgery. Said, here's another question about internal fixation. How do you feel about application of a medial plate when you're treating a proximal humerus fracture, applying a plate medially on the calcar? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's, uh, I didn't use it in my practice. I think uh, that will require a lot of dissection, disturbing the blood supply. Uh, I can see putting a plate internally instead of the strut. And we do that the same with the with the with the other lower extremity, and especially prostatic fractures. We do that, and the, uh, they do it in the knees, not just on the shoulder. But I think uh, there was uh, there was a few uh, this technique about using a smaller blade to restore the calcar. I think it's that's overkill. Okay, it is uh, the uh, maybe uh, when you look at the fracture itself depends on what you're dealing with you're dealing with a young man or you're dealing with the adult with the sorry with the osteoporotic uh, older age so if it's dealing with a young man i will overall reduction is more important than just going over small pieces and uh, you need to put a screw to support that calcar uh, to avoid collapse yes but i will not go to put the plate very uh, there, it's overkill. Elderly, if it is that comminuted that you need to put a plate there, then just go ahead and do reverse and move on. Yep. I think orthoplasty will be a better option over there. Asha, there's okay. one more question for you. In the second case that you showed, yes. in the patient with AVN, yes. why did you select a reverse shoulder instead of hemiarthroplasty, because the patient was 52. Uh, we went ahead uh, and we saw that the cuff was, uh, the cuff condition was not good. So we, uh, the initial plan was going ahead with a hemiarthroplasty only, but the glenoid side was also very much involved and the cuff condition was also bad. So uh, a, a surgery or a final surgery would have been a, a reverse for him. On table, it was, it was a decision which was made on table. So unfortunately, we are not able to get a good MRI with the processes or any kind of a osteosynthesis in situ. So uh, it becomes very difficult to really uh, uh, see the uh, rotator cuff. And moreover, uh, functionally, he was very much in pain. He was not able to do any kind of active abduction. Okay. Uh, Professor Altani, uh, that is one question about the uh, technique. Uh, to use the locking plate. Uh, some doctor wondering that, uh, how about the idea that uh, we fix the plate to the head of humerus and the tuberosity first, and then we fixing the plate to the sharp. Did you do like that or different? Yeah. Well, I do lateral approach. So I do, uh, I pass the shoulder, the plate under the axillary nerve. And then I put one K wire in the head just mm -hmm. to judge my height uh, yeah. of the plate and the head and make sure that I didn't lose it. Then I open a small incision distally in the shaft and I realign my plate, realign my fracture, put one, fixi one screw distally just to control the height and control uh, the length and the reduction. Then if I'm happy, I put a second screw distally to control the rotation of the shaft. Then I go and finish my screws up. Then I, I, I finish the okay. third screw distally. So I go up and down. I keep the, the incision yes. up and down open. But I feel my axillary nerve and I pass between the bone and the axillary. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Ache? Yes. 
uh, uh, I would ask, like to ask the panelists, or uh, if I am uh, allowed to ask, how easy it is always to, in case uh, a, a bad scenario, to revise uh, osteosynthesis done from a lateral approach. Uh, how easy uh, or difficult it is, or do you use the same approach to revise your osteosynthesis in case there is a screw breakout or something like that, or implant fails? Well, you can use the same approach. You have to know your anatomy. You have to know where's your axillary nerve. You know, and I, I like the uh, approach. You just open completely the whole incision as one. See your axillary nerve and protect it and just uh, do a minimal dissection of the scar tissue. Uh, take it off the plate before you remove your screws. So uh, in my case, uh, I'm I'm very much uh, I mean uh, used to the deltopectoral approach. So I use a, a deltopectoral approach uh, with the CM on the opposite side. So it really aids it. And I use the liver technique uh, in case uh, uh, liver the head up and then all those maneuvers which we have to use and try. I I first and foremost thing which I do is that take control of the tuberosities. Take control of the tuberosities with a number five ethibon. And in some cases, uh, which which I feel I use a fiber tape. So, and then use that tape and pass it through the uh, phyllos plate and uh, though that gives a real good sense of fixation and uh, uh, somehow that helps me in positioning my plate uh, optimally whenever I'm putting uh, in a four part or a three part proximal humerus fracture and then putting the screws first and foremost, getting the plate exactly aligned to the bone and then filling the proximal holes and the distal holes. So that, that really helps. Those tuberosity controls, they, they matter a lot. Delta Bectoral is a gold standard and uh, it's been there for many, many years. Uh, it is just, as I said earlier, it's a surgeon preference. Uh, I feel more comfortable with the lateral approach uh, in my hand. I do both approach in certain cases, uh, especially if the bone quality is good. But if the bone quality is uh, osteoporotic or bone quality is bad, I go back to lateral approach because I don't need to dissect around the uh, greater tuberosity. I don't need to dissect around the uh, infraspinatus. I can see them, I can put, if I want to put another plate to buttress uh, the GT off the fellows plate, I have a small place to put a small fragment uh, or one third tubular like a buttressing. Sometimes the screws doesn't go into the bigger chunk it goes to the main chunk, but not. And so you need to add another plate posteriorly to, to hold things. So thank that's you. give me flexibility. Thank you. thank you very much. Let's uh, wrap up this session. Thank you for two excellent presentations yes. and discussion. Thank you to my co-moderator. We'll yeah, move on to you. the elbow section. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we will move on to the elbow session. Uh, please. Welcome, uh, Professor Al Chani. He is the moderator of the next session, please. So I would like uh, to welcome uh, Professor Christian uh, Feng uh, from, uh, he's the chief uh, deputy of uh, the Division of Orthopedic Trauma and clinical associate professor and early consultant. Uh, He's an orthopedic trauma of the wrist, elbow, and shoulder, and hip and stabulum, and knee and ankle. 3D printing for deformity, trauma, and musculoskeletal condition. He's uh, performing a lot of reverse shoulder replacement and uh, dealing with the osteoporotic uh, injury as well. Professor uh, Fung, uh, the stage is yours, talking about the interarticular elbow fracture. Thank you, Prof. Fontani. So I'll share the screen. It's a great honor to be with you all in this uh, upper limb session. I'll be talking about comminuted intraticular elbow fractures. Particularly, I'll be focusing on Montagia variants. These are difficult fractures. So what we know from uh, the evidence is these type of Montagia fractures, when associated with either anterior or posterior dislocation of the radial head is associated with poorer prognosis. Those are the battle type two or four and Jupiter classification 2A, 2D. Anyway, 
the key is when the articular part is comminuted and if the joint is unstable, you get poor prognosis. Let's go to one of the example cases. We go straight to the CT scan. She's a 48 year old lady, had a simple fall injury and a fracture pattern like that. We look at the 3D, we can assess clearly. Look at the coronoid. The coronoid is a rather big piece here. Look at the ol olecranon. It is shattered, very small. Look at the radio head. This is not dislocated. So I would say this one is rather easy. Olecranon. So I want to introduce you this list, how to analyze the problems, because these are always going to be com complicated. We look at the ulnar. What's the status of the olecranon? This is comminuted and small in this case. What's the status of the coronoid and the metaphysis? It's large. It's a large spike wedge, relatively easy. What's the status of the radius? Is this dislocated? It's slightly subluxated, but you can guess the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is probably okay. Is there head and neck radial fractures? None in this case. So we just go straight forward to fix the ulnar and put two additional K wires to a small olecranon fragment. Not much, not much attention to the ligaments, to the radio head. She gets good outcome. Let's look at another one. That's a 54 year old lady. So nowadays we have this 3D technologies. I always want to get a 3D reconstruction of all the cases and really look at it. And in PowerPoint, we can actually show these 3D illustrations quite clearly. So look at the radio head here. So we'll go through the list, owner, the olecranon, what's the status? It's the large, largest, uh, largest olecranon fragment but the coronoid and the sublime cubicle is really comminuted. That's gonna be difficult and problematic. Are we going to be able to get a good fixation here? Um, so most of the attention has to be paid here. That's my favorite approach, uh, the direct posterior midline approach. And I want to go on either side of the owner and use suture cerclage if possible and 3D printing many of the uh, fragments. So intraoperatively, I can have a look and assess where to put these sutures. The sutures usually are very reliable in giving a preliminary reduction. And I favor the uh, knee snot uh, surplage loop technique. So you can bring the sutures to a temporary uh, tension and you can release it if you don't like it and retention later on. So here you can see a fracture gap and these are my favorite implants with special tabs. So screws can be inserted towards the sublime tubicle to the coronoid and multiple of them. And then also into small uh, olecranon fragments. So these case, if reduced nicely, fixed nicely, they would end up with a good outcome and without too much soft tissue dissection. So the key is really to analyze each of these cases. That's a 46 year old gynecologist. Uh, um, so we look at again at the 3D uh, assessment here. So we go through the list again, look at the owner side first, look at the olecranon. It's a really big fragment. So this is easy, but look at the coronoid here. There's a smaller, a smaller, uh, medial uh, radial side of the coronoid and a metaphyseal fragment. So much attention has to be paid to these two fragments. Firstly, not to uh, detach the ligaments, the anterior capsule. Secondly, really to get a good reduction. And when we move to the radial side, it is really a uh, partial fracture of the head. I think a couple of uh, headless screws should do the trick here without a replacement. You see that if most of the radio head is intact and it's not posterior dislocated tendency, it's, it's stable. So these are fixed in a way, similar surplage uh, sutures to reduce the metaphysis, radio head uh, screws, and then also uh, fixing the ulnar. Mind you that towards the end of the surgery, I discovered the uh, LUCL is not uh, particularly absolutely stable. So we add in two more uh, suture anchors to, to reduce it. 
Let's go to a more difficult example, 83 year old lady. This one is a really small coronoid type. So these one will require entirely different technique. Again, go through the list, look at the olecranon. It's smallish, but still fixable with screws. The problem comes with the coronoid here, multi-fragmentary, very small. You can't really put a plate in there to hope to stabilize it. And the radio head is gone. It is totally shattered. Again, there is no hope in uh, reducing or repairing this. So these one go for a replacement, radio head replacement. And then my trick is to use a suture to uh, fix to the anterior capsule and bring it backwards and tie onto the plate on the bone. Intra intraoperatively, uh, we use the uh, trans olecranon fracture approach. Since it's fracture already, we might as well go through the fracture, remove the radio head, see that's the radius. Uh, the coronoid, we don't detach it. Attach it to strong sutures so you can tie it back up to the plate uh, in front. So really the coronoid have uh, three different types, small, medium, large, and there are different ways to tackle it. Small ones, sutures, medium ones, you can also use sutures, but sometimes you need an anterior buttress plate, especially if the uh, owner in the posterior part is intact. There's no way to go through the back. You have to go through the front. I personally don't prefer anterior plates because the chance of uh, joint stiffness or nerve injury and in split FCU approach um, is higher. And if it's large, it's easier to use leg screw and surclage sutures. And this is really a main, uh, main consideration in your decision making. The problems, survive tubicle fractures, radio head loosening, valgus drift, each of these, they happen. Now, these are similar cases. If not fixed nicely, uh, we try to plate the sublime tubicle, and not successful. They go into uh, posterior medial uh, instability and migration. Similar case like that, you see, uh, osteoarthritis of the medial part of the elbow joint. Eventually, uh, these loosen and they require elbow replacement. Luckily, after elbow replacement, usually these patients do fine. And the other side, if we don't have a good um, radial side of the coronoid, and then the uh, radial head is not well fixed with an implant, they go to uh, valgus drift, radial head loosening. The uh, symptoms of these patients are relatively less, but the cosmesis is not very good. Let's look at one last case. So this one, again, uh, it's a moderate size coronoid, very comminuted looking from the CT. But if we analyze systematically, the coronoid, uh, the electron tip is not that bad. Coronoid, it's a big size, one side, uh, one fragment from uh, radial to to the uh, sublime tubicle. So if we fix this one critically well, he sh she should do well. Radio head is all uh, shattered, you see. So theoretically, you should require replacement. So let's see what's done in this case. We actually um, put good screws into the large uh, sublime tubicle fragment, um, and it was stable enough, and we thought the uh, ligamentous stability is actually quite good. These old ladies, usually when they injure the elbow, energy is lower, so uh, ligaments are better without doing anything to the radio head. She has this in uh, three months time. So really not too bad. If you pay attention to the list, um, they can have good outcomes. So that's the summary. Uh, approach mainly posterior, coronoid fixation, according to size, sutures or clutch, very useful. Uh, ligamentous stability plays a critical consideration and the radio head replacement only if it's unstable, not always. Thank you very much. That's my slides. So thank you for Dr. Tristan. So now we move to our next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Yong Kwan Ko. He is an associate professor at the Asan Medical Youth Center at Seoul. He has a highly uh, active in ac academic work, has so many publications, 
and he also added the editorial board of the arthroscopy journey. He will talk in about the elbow replacement for elderly osteoporotic fracture tips and tricks. Please welcome. Professor Go, you are muted. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Wang Go from Seoul. My talk is uh, the tips and tricks for elbow replacement for elderly osteoporotic fractures. But in the first place, can we justify the total elbow osteoplasty for fracture? How many total elbow osteoplasty have you done in a year? In my practice, actually, I perform three or four total elbow osteoplasty per year. So uh, the cases for total elbow osteoplasty for fracture are extremely rare in my practice. The key message from my talk is not the tips and tricks for elbow osteoplasty. Actually, in cemented fixation of total elbow osteoplasty, also, process is not a big deal, and probably total elbow is much easier than osteosynthesis. However, osteoplasty for fracture should be reserved for the final salvage because we need lifetime limitation of weight lifting in total elbow, and we need lifetime surveillance for further complication. The only tips I think for total elbow osteoplasty in fracture is you can use triceps on approach. With this approach, your rehabilitation can be accelerated. So let's take a look at the outcome of a total elbow osteoplasty in fracture. This is the first report of total elbow osteoplasty, which was published in 1997 by Dr. Moray and R in an elderly patient. They included 21 elbows with 10 rheumatoid arthritis, and they suggested that Total elbow osteoplasty can be an alternative form of treatment in severely committed fracture. Uh, several studies also reported excellent and reliable short-term outcome with the total elbow in elderly distalimus fracture. This is the study comparing total elbow osteoplasty and osteosynthesis. Uh, this is the uh, study by Dr. Marco Frankel, which was the, which is the one of the most famous shoulder and elbow osteoplasty surgeon. He reported the excellent outcome in total elbow osteoplasty and suggested total elbow is better. Another study by Dr. McGee, he also reported a better clinical outcome, less surgical time, less reoperation in total elbow osteoplasty. At this moment, let's review radiographs in previous those studies. But do you agree the indication for total elbow osteoplasty for first two cases? And are you happy with the reduction and fixation with these radiographs? Are you happy with the fixation with this fracture pattern? Do you agree the indication for total elbow osteoplasty in this fracture? Also, are you happy with the total elbow in this fracture pattern? Are you happy with the fracture fixation in this case? So I'm sorry, I can't agree with the quality of reduction and fixation in those studies. I can't agree with the indication for total elbow osteoplasty with these uh, radiographs. So what is the indications for total elbow osteoplasty? Probably severely comminuted articular fracture, low transcondylar fracture, and sometimes old enough with osteoporosis. You can see articular commission in this patient, but without osteoporosis, articular commission can be overcome with the help of a multiple K wire screws or provisional plate fixation. You can overcome. How about this case? You can see low fracture line and some articular commission 
in 74 year female and one month of surgical delay. In this case, I think the total elbow arthropus is more preferable. How about this case? There, are, uh, there was severe commission in articular site and with the molecular fracture. So someone might want to total elbow arthroplasty in this case. But what if the patient is only 40 years old? Do you still want total elbow arthroplasty? Total elbow arthroplasty at 40 years old might mean lifetime restriction of a, a weightlifting or daily activity. And there, there may be some need for lifetime surveillance for complication. 88 years old female patient with a, a intercondylar fracture, you can see some articular commission, but if you can achieve the adequate fixation, adequate reduction, then I think the osteosynthesis is most uh, preferable treatment. You can see another aspect of a total elbow. This is a 10 year follow up study. Beside the clinical lizard, they included 37 cases. Among them, 23 died. Only 13 cases can be assessed. Another study, including 42 patients, after all, at final follow up, only 10 patients can survive for the uh, final assessment. So the total elbow osteoplasty might need lifetime surveillance, even if uh, uh, even you can, you can acquire some fun similar functional outcome with the uh, osteosynthesis. You might need lifetime surveillance for complication like uh, infection, fracture, or loosening. You can think you you should think about the another burden of a total elbow. You should keep lifetime restriction of weight lifting less than five pounds. So recent study comparing total elbow arthroplasty, total elbow arthroplasty and osteosynthesis suggest another aspect of a total elbow arthroplasty. They suggest the osteosynthesis is better than total elbow in terms of a later complication. Another study, similar range of motion functional score, OLIF, all union, no conversion, but total elbow osteoplasty showed the 63% of reoperation. So osteosynthesis might be technically demanding, especially when there is a anatomical, uh, there is a uh, articular fragment commission. Osteosis is more, more, more problematic in osteosynthesis. But with the current tech, tech, technology of locking plate, once the fracture heals, there may be no need for less restriction in daily living. Only outcome of a total elbow would be promising, but it cannot guarantee long-term outcome, and they'll still need lifetime limitation of weight lifting. So I think that total elbow arthroplasty for fracture is indicated only in elderly who failed osteosynthesis, or osteosynthesis seems too difficult, and there is significant osteoporosis, and patient is too old then you can consider total elbow osteoplasty. Thank you very much. I think it's up to the Q&A sessions for us. Uh, maybe I will uh, bring out the questions. Okay, so I will ask the question first for you, Dr. Christian. So I got a question from the floor, uh, from our uh, ask about, how do you manage about the ulnar nerve when you deal with the fracture? Uh, I see that from uh, Dr. Lee, the question about ulnar nerve. Um, yes, in the old days, I use the split flexor carpi ulnaris approach to go to the coronoid medially. Uh, the problem is with the ulnar nerve. You see it. And then some patients have late ulnar nerve problems because of the scarring. They don't come immediately post-op. 
they come three months, six months now, nine months down the line. They have this strange numbness. And even after you release it, it doesn't really work. So it, it came to me that now I'm totally avoiding seeing the own nerve uh, as much as possible. So the preference is to directly go posterior. Don't see the ulnar nerve. Don't use the split uh, FCU approach at all. If I need to go anterior, I will use the, uh, the uh, modified Hotchkiss or 50-50 approach, go through the muscle mass and then avoid the ulnar nerve. I, I think uh, this way we actually avoid most of the ulnar nerve problems altogether. So, Okay, how about Dr. Ko? Would you manage the ulnar nerve? I always uh, find the ulnar nerve and then identify. And if usually trauma surgeon prefer FSU a splitting approach, but I think uh, it, with, this, with that approach, sometimes you can have some difficulty to, uh, to the coronary process. So I would prefer the case by case. Mm -hmm. And usually ulnar nerve can be uh, transposed to the anterior. Okay, that means you transport the nerve until, okay. Uh, so another question uh, for the Dr. Christian. Uh, so um, I think you have the very wondering technique uh, how to replace the, uh, the radio head from the posterior through the factor side. So uh, how do you determine the size or the length or the height of the radio head prosthesis? from that approach, because that is not usual approach for the radio head replacement. Uh, yes, the question from Erica, yep. uh, I think a uh, very difficult question. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have a good answer. From the lateral conventional radio head, we know we want the radio head to be two mm smaller than what you measure and never make it long, always test. And we really look at the uh, fluoroscopy, the X-ray, the joint line, in the sublime cubicle and the ulno humeral joint, uh, joint space has to be equal. So we look at the anteroposterior uh, fluoroscopy very carefully and, and tilt the elbow in a little bit of external and internal rotation, make sure the gap is not widened. I think that's the best guess uh, that you have. So the uh, suture reduction technique that I use brings gives you a chance of uh, temporary reduction so you can always uh, put your radio head trial in and temporarily reduce the electron flip it back close everything without the plate so it won't block your way in assessing uh, for in the fluoroscopy and then if it doesn't go right just open up and then change the head size of course uh, we look at the uh, radio head grossly to see that the height actually matches the uh, proximal radio ulnar joint, where the, uh, the, uh, the, the coronoid is really, it must not be higher than the coronoid. I think that's, that's the way I do it. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I think we had a lot of questions, so I would, I would try to make it uh, more relation <laughs> to, to your talk, okay? Uh, so uh, I think we move to the Dr. Ko about the total elbow arthroplasty. Uh, that's another question from the floor. They asked you about how about the total elbow arthroplasty for the very low comminuted fracture in young adult? That is a very tough question for you, I, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes. So actually, I, I believe that if, if you can fix it and use it, you always should try to, to do so osteosynthesis. But the problem is that you have to decide whether to arthroplasty or uh, osteosynthesis because your arthroplasty usually need uh, intact or, or like quinone. Osteosynthesis usually needs some osteotomy. That's a pro one, one problem. But anyway, if, if it is possible, I always try to uh, reduce the fracture. And at that time, I usually use a parallel plating. I think parallel plating is more, uh, have advantage for very low transcondylar fracture or something. Okay. 
Can I ask a question about the approach you use for total elbow? Um, for fractures, it's slightly different because sometimes you want to sacrifice the the uh, epicondyles, mm -hmm. and then it makes your approach actually easier. Therefore, for me personally, I do not split or detach the tricep mechanism. Uh, I use a para olecranon approach. I want to know, know your approach for fractures in total elbow. Yes, I agree with you totally. I, I think that the only, only advantage of a total elbow arthroplasty in fracture, you can use triceps on own approach. So I prefer total elbow with the triceps on approach like, like you. Mm. So sparing the triceps really, yeah, yes. you don't need any protection afterwards. Yes, yes. That's great. So Dr. Ko, that means you plan before you do the surgery, right? Yes, yes. You face the very difficult distal humoral factor. Mm -hmm. And how many cases that you change your mind that you should turn on to be just like the total elbow atroplasty intraoperatively? Uh, if I have to decide intraoperatively, I have to prepare two implants like a, a total elbow and also this is plate. But I don't know. This is a very tough question. So. I think we have to do it uh, uh, per case. I don't know. Yeah, I agree with you. That's very, really difficult question for me too. But but somehow situation is difficult. So maybe some some of the uh, my colleague they asked to do just like the maybe the trap approach for the fixation of the distal humerus, and maybe if you want to turn to the total elbow, it's maybe much more easier. Something like that. How about no. you? In the case of a, in the case of which we uh, have some problem is a, a C three type intercondylar fracture, not C one C two. C one C two you can do it anyway without any detaching of the triceps or uh, osteotomy. But the problem is that this always C three. So in C three, it's not it's not easy to determine before the surgery. I think but we have to do. Okay, so thank you. So we have another question about the approach for Dr. Dr. Chris, Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your preferred surgical approach for the radial head fixation between the Koga approach and the common extensor splitting? Oh, okay. Uh, really depends on the location of the radial head fracture. So if it's more interior, I use the so-called uh, Kaplan, Kaplan or common extensor splitting approach. If it's more lateral or posterior, I use the Cocker. Problem with nowadays, uh, many of the radial head fractures, they're actually terrible triad injuries. So the Cocker approach is really through the uh, LUCL and you, you have a tendency to either damage it or it's already damaged. So, so that's really depends on the situation. Uh, I don't know what are your insights, the, the other experts here. I have a question, Dr. Fang. Yes. Actually, not every surgeon can use a 3D printing like you. So, so if you can use a 3D printing, then your surgery will be easier, but not everyone can use that kind of a technology. So what's your tip, tips for who, can, who cannot use the, the 3D printing in oh. complex coronary fracture? I tell you, uh, 3D printing is extremely useful and is extremely cheap. So what you need to do is go to YouTube and watch how to use free software and convert your CT scan into a 3D model like what I showed in the PowerPoints just now, you can do it at home or in your office with a very modest computer hardware. Once you have that, you can upload the STL file. It's like a JPEG file in 3D online. So there are lots of printing companies that do prints and they send to your office, uh, mail to your office. This thing can be done in around three or four days in the cycle, even if you don't have the printer in your office. That's option one. Option two, if you do this uh, process, your thought process of looking through the 3D model, you don't actually need the 3D model. Going through it, looking at it, really already gives you the insight of um, 
knowing very accurately where each small fragment is, how to put the screw. I think this is extremely important for these uh, complex fractures. Okay. Thank you for a great question. I know. Maybe uh, Dr. Saiz, maybe have some questions. You are, you are muted. Uh, there was a question, but that's, I think, to the shoulder session was asked. Uh, the major problem with the total elbow is uh, the polyethylene wheel. Uh, so uh, they are asking about the humeral heavy arthroplasty. We talk about it <clears throat> early, that it has a poor outcome and only limited to the humeral uh, head splitting uh, cases. But let us go back to the elbow uh, that would invite this question as uh, what you tell the patient regarding uh, the polyethylene wheel. What is your advice to them? Rosico. Actually, the polyethylene problem is more prob problematic in total elbow. So I think uh, uh, in younger patient, younger patient and you, can avoid, you, you cannot avoid the total elbow arthroplasty, then you can consider some kind of a hemi arthroplasty uh, from the latitude implant. Take, you can use uh, that implant with uh, only hemi for the distal humerus. But in that case, you, your ligament should be intact. Your, or I have one case for tumor. In tumor, uh, I have to remove the distal humerus, the whole distal humerus, and I use the uh, allograft of a distal humerus. In that case, if you can repair anterior and posterior capsule tightly and uh, lateral side ligament repair can be possible, then you can use a hemiarthroplasty for those patients who are worried about, who are con who the pushing wear is concerned. I think hemiarthroplasty can be another option. Oh, by the way, I have a question, Dr. Uh, radio heads. We have the cemented, non-cemented, now we have the radio heads that are designed to be not cemented, but loose from day one, which are, what, what's your thought? What's your preference on these implants? I, I think for the radial head replacement, I think a non-cemented by Dr. Graham King would be preferable than that uh, were fixed with a um, cementless fixation. I mean, naturally we cannot match the uh, original radial head. So, if your radial head, radial processes is uh, somewhat, there is somewhat reluctance, uh, then your, your radial head will be adapted, adapted to the original anatomy. So I, th I think if I have to use a radial head, I prefer uh, that kind of a, uh, somewhat loosened, loosened implant for radial processes. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we have another question, another question for Dr. Fan. Uh, so as we know, uh, the dorsal surface of the ulna is not flat, right? Maybe somehow ulna dorsal angulation would help, uh, would happen about the Montagier. So what would you think about how, you, how do you consider about the dorsal ulna angulation when you fixation of this kind of fracture? Dorsal, um, yeah. It's, I, yeah. I see the question from Inho. I think he is asking the uh, yep on the dorsal angle on the posterior side of the owner. Oh, mm. I don't really have a great thought about it. Usually, it's uh, I try to do it anatomical reduction. So the owner in Chinese name is called ruler bone ruler R U L E R ruler because it's straight. Called we call it the straight bone. Uh, that means the reduction you should aim at. The posterior surface straight, just like a straight line. Uh, of course, if the uh, radio head is dislocated posteriorly or anteriorly, that would affect our decision. We have a tendency to make it more flexed if it's uh, anterior dislocation, more extended if it's more uh, posterior dislocation. But um, this is really useful only for chronic cases and pediatric cases. 
pediatric case, uh, especially those with a plastic deformation. But in adults, uh, I think objective is still straight anatomical reduction. Uh, I see some other questions here. One is uh, how I pass the suture around the proximal ulnar in the posterior approach. Uh, I use these 90 degrees, uh, we call it Leahy uh, artery forceps. So the ulnar bone is a relative, relatively small bone. We don't really need those uh, femur circular muscles. Using one of those uh, 90 degrees artery, we can pass it from, uh, from either side of the ulnar bone. So we, we, we just need to dig a little bit deeper uh, particularly in the coronoid, there's also a question asking me how to anchor the stitch into the anterior capsule. Uh, very importantly, the anterior capsule must not be detached from the coronoid bone fragment because the point of the coronoid is it's the attachment for the capsule and a stabilizing structure preventing the joint from posterior dislocation. Therefore, if we put a suture there, what my preference is the most simple kind, just a loop and a grasping stitch coming back out. It's more like the uh, Kessler suture for, for repairing hand tendons. Uh, it doesn't need to be anatomical. And if you have a very large fragment, uh, you put it in either side. So going in from the radial side, coming out from the ulnar side, you can put up to two stitch and tie it over the, uh, the plate. Preferably, you put the stitch through the hole in the plate so there is no chance for the suture to traverse proximally or distally and loosen. Uh, that's my answer. OK, so thank you. Um, I'm looking for the questions. When dealing with Montagia fracture, uh, after fixing olecranon anatomically, the radio head should be reduced. Have you ever had a case when radio head went out immediately day one? Not in adults, but in kids. Yes, in, in children, these are tricky, but I think it's, it's totally another <laughs> issue. It's usually related to a uh, malreduction of the ulnar shaft. Uh, one trick I, I can share is uh, the, the ulnar, if it's chronic, uh, the radial head is chronically dislocated. And if you're going from the back um, and the dislocation is to anterior side, you can put a loop suture through the radial neck and the loop suture can be tied towards the ulnar implant, the plate. This creates a, a constraining device that prevents the radial head from moving anteriorwards. I think that is very useful if there's an anterior dislocation. However, if it's a posterior dislocation, you really have to uh, repair the LUCL or put a fiber tape kind of uh, graft or uh, composite material, you know, internal brace to really reconstruct the LUCL. Uh, posterior dislocation is much more difficult to, to hand, handle. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I think we have the last question about the option about the radio head excision in trauma. What would you think about this option? <laughs> Maybe what of you? So, uh, the questions to me, Dr. Cole. Radio head excision for Dr. Pang. Well, wow. Uh, non-union or AVN. Yeah, excision is for old age, not for young age, because they will have a proximal migration of the radial head. They end up with wrist pain, wrist problem. Uh, so you put in a radial prosthesis. If it's uh, a lot of bone loss, you put in a long stem. Huge amount of bone loss, you put in a custom prosthesis, 3D printed. Uh, nowadays, it's possible. Uh, AVN, you deal with it the same way. Old age, just don't do anything. Young age change it to prevent the uh, collapse in length. So I think we have so many questions, Dr. Saeed, <laughs> but we run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a Three, nice one. introduction. And uh, I think we time to move on to the next session. Thank you. 
I think I'm the moderator for the next session. So I'll share the screen for the uh, next presenters. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Randy Bindra. He is a very well-traveled uh, upper limb and hand surgeon trained in India, UK, USA, and also had fellowship uh, all over the world. He's now practicing uh, in Melbourne and also uh, the chair of the, I think, uh, Education Commission of the uh, Australian Hand Surgery Society. So may I have uh, Professor Randy Bindra to give his talk on complex distal radius fracture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, and uh, indeed, this is a great format for discussion. And what I'm going to do in the next uh, 10 minutes is um, just talk a little different approach for the distal radius, since most of the time when you see a distal radius fracture, everybody simply thinks volar plate, volar plate through the Henry approach. And that probably solves 95% of the cases we see in our practice. I'm gonna show you slightly different cases, a little bit more challenging, where we need to look at the imaging carefully, uh, look at associated carpal injuries, and I'll show a case of revision surgery just to put these principles into place. So here is a young man, 18 years old, ejected from a car, uh, and he's got a fracture dislocation of his left wrist. In addition, he's got a pelvic fracture, other injuries, uh, he's complaining of hand numbness. Now. When you look at this x-ray carefully, right, he's, he's got a, a little metacarpal shaft fracture, which we'll ignore for now. But when you look at the key fragments and what's going on with the wrist, what we realize is he's a dorsal fracture dislocation of the wrist. So he's, he's a radiocarpal dislocation because the lunate has come out of the radius. Now, in order for the lunate to come out, this is not a dorsal button. The lunate has come out of the radius. He's taken out the radial styloid. So he's taken out the main ligamentous stabilizers. So the lunate has come out along with the radial styloid. So when you try to reduce these, they are obviously unstable. And what's important here, when you look at the post-reduction CT scan, which is critical in the planning, is the fact that that lunate articular facet has come out of the joint and has flipped out and needs to be flipped back into the joint and needed to repair the soft tissue structures here to bring back everything into place and restore stability. So the key here is this radial styloid with the long radial lunate ligament that's attached to it. And here we've got a little articular fragment that's fallen out with the short radial lunate uh, ligament here and the wrist capsule that we need to repair back to this distal radius. So in order to get back the styloid, one could use a volar plate, but a better principle would be to apply a buttress plate to the side to fix these fractures. Now, in addition, we need to decompress the carpal tunnel. So a standard FCR approach would be challenging. And hence, in this case, an extended kind of volar ulnar approach gives you wide exposure to the distal radius. So that's the kind of exposure we've done for this case. The advantage of this is this can extend upwards and you can do an entire forearm fasciotomy uh, using this technique. Now we've done that uh, volar ulnar approach the FDP and all the uh, flexor tendons are radially. Ulnar neurovascular bundle, ulnarly. Here's the fragment of the lunate that has been ejected out of the articular surface. So now we are redislocating the uh, radiocarpal joint so we can put the articular surface of the radius, the lunate facet back in place. Then we can reduce the wrist back onto it. Once we've done that, we turn our attention to the radial side of the wrist where we make an incision of the styloid, apply a styloid plate with a K-wire. Now, the moment you put that K-wire in the styloid, suddenly everything becomes stable. Good to do an X-ray now, check that the radiocarpal joint is aligned. Then you can turn attention back to the volar incision where you can pull down that short radiolunate ligament and anchor it down with some bone anchors into the distal radius, as you can see here. So once we've got the volar capsule stable, 
We've got the lateral part stabilized. The joint is generally stable. And then we keep them immobilized for about four weeks and then start range of motion exercises. Now, in some cases where they are not stable, a spanning plate may also be indicated. And you could certainly do it if they have lower limb injuries and have to weight bear on that arm. Here's the second case now, very similar, but this is not a fracture dislocation. This is simply a severely dis dorsally disrupted distal radius. You can see the TFC is clearly torn here, but he's got severe median nerve symptoms because clearly the median nerve is tented around the distal radius. Now, the reduction here, as you can see, is pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good. But in a severe high velocity injury like this, not a good, not a bad idea to get a CT scan. And surprisingly, he's got a scaphoid fracture and he's got an avulsion of the volar horn of the lunate uh, in this patient. So CT scan and high velocity injuries will often show you things that might surprise you. So simply here, we've got a decompressor carpal tunnel. He's got the neuropathy. We got to get to that lunate fragment and we've got to fix the scaphoid. So in the same fashion, we've done a volar ulnar approach and there's that lunate fragment. It's too small to fix back to the lunate. So we've excised it. We've now put an anchor in the volar horn of the lunate and we're repairing the mid, jo mid carpal joint capsule so that we can get a secure capsular reduction. Now the distal radius fracture, this is a distal radius fracture. This is not a radiocarpal dislocation. So once we've repaired the mid carpal joint, we now go ahead and put a volar plate. So it's possible to put a volar distal radius plate from this volar ulnar approach. You do have to make your incision a little bit larger. Once you fix the plate, now we've got to fix the scaphoid. So we make a one centimeter incision dorsally and then using a limited open approach, pass a guide wire through the scaphoid to the front and you can put a screw and fix that fracture. So that's how we've managed this patient who had that little lunate fracture there, scaphoid fracture, and this uh, uh, radius fracture. And we've managed also to decompress the, ulnar, uh, the median nerve by going through this volar ulnar approach. Now here is a young medical student and as medical students do when they're celebrating after graduation, uh, a little bit too much to drink, uh, fall down some stairs. Now, when you look at these injury films, look at the way this fragment is flipped over and is pulled off with the wrist when it dislocated dorsally. Now he's been treated elsewhere. And if you look at the close reduction, that fragment has not been correctly reduced. It's just fallen out of place. So they did a good job in the other hospital where they fixed that volar ulnar fragment and they put an external fixator. However, they have not reduced the depression of the joint surface. So the carpus is still slightly dorsally subluxated on the radius. So the patients now come back three weeks later. So we got to take this apart. So we've done some imaging. And in this case, we did use some 3D imaging. And if you're not as good as Christian, all you need is a good registrar. And a good registrar will do the imaging for you and make the prints for you. So in this case, you can see there's a big gap here dorsally. This surface needs to be elevated to be brought up here. Now, in this kind of a case, to get a good exposure, it's a good idea to go dorsally and volarly because you want a good exposure of the radiocarpal joint. So this is a dorsal approach. And as you can see, I clean and leave the external fixator pins in place in case I need them for intraoperative traction. The first thing we see when we do the dorsal approach between the third and the fifth compart the fourth compartments is there's a proximal uh, injury to the scaphoid ligament, but it's in the proximal part, so not important. This is the joint surface that's depressed. Here is the wire coming through from the front. Now we go to the front. The median nerve is severely scarred. So we've done a median neurolysis by going ulnar to the FCR. Then we've taken out the metal work and put a volar plate. So now from the front, we are applying a plate and from the, from the back, we've got the joint surface lined up. There's a gap here in this articular uh, holding up that subchondral surface. In these cases, I like to use uh, uh, calcium phosphate, which hardens up and gives you a nice buttress and that's the patient uh, did not require plate removal because we fixed the fracture from the front, but we use the dorsal approach to get anatomical alignment of the articular surface with this being a more complicated and late presentation with revision fixation. So to summarize, when you're looking at these complicated distal radius fractures, 
First thing in the emergency room, make sure they don't have median nerve symptoms, very common with complex fractures. Secondly, if you see somebody with a high velocity injury, have a low threshold to get a CT scan, you will pick up carpal injuries that you may miss otherwise. When you're fixing a radius fracture, think of the key fragments. Do I need to buttress the styloid of the radius? Is there a volar ulnar fragment? Is there a ligament disruption that I need to repair? Think of the volar ulnar approach, very useful in complex cases, very swollen arms. And if you're doing a revision, don't hesitate to do a combined approach, but if possible, keep your fixation on the one side to minimize stiffness. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bindra, for the sharing your uh, nice uh, cases. So let me uh, introduce Dr. Yukio Abe from, uh, Yukio Abe is a clinical associate professor at Yamaguchi University School of Medicine. Now he serves as a vice principal of uh, Shimonosuke General Hospital in Japan. Uh, he will talk about uh, distal radius fracture and DRJ instability, the role of wrist arthroscopy. Uh, Dr. Abe, please. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for the moderation, Dr. Fang and Dr. Lee. I'm Yukio Abe from Japan. Uh, today, we, I'm going to talk about distal radius fracture and DRJ instability and discuss the role of lithoscopy. There are several principles of the treatment for DRF, including to get the anatomical alignment and joint surface, and intraarticular soft tissue injuries such as TFCC and ACL injury can be evaluated and treated simultaneously. From these aspects, wrist arthroscopy seems to be advantageous. Volar locking plate fixation is currently a gold standard procedure. Therefore, we have tried to faci fast facilitate doing wrist arthroscopy during plate fixation. We developed the procedure PART that stands for Plate Presetting Arthroscopic Reduction Technique and initially published in 2008. How to do it? Prior to surgery, CT scan, including 3D CT, is quite useful to plan how to reduce the fracture fragment. Initially, volar side of the skin is incised, pronator quadratus is elevated, and volar fracture site is identified and reduced directly. Under fluoroscopy, we reduce alignment using some interfocal pins. This is a typical case of C3 fracture. The first pin is inserted from the radial side to reduce radial inclination. Second and third pins are from dorsal side to reduce palmar tilt. Interarticular fragments are also reduced under fluoroscopy as accurate as possible, and fractures are fixed with some interfragmental KYS and apply provisional BLP fixation. After reduction, arthroscopy is inserted and removed hematoma. 3D CT is useful to realize condition of the joint surface by comparing it with arthroscopic view. As the alignment is reduced fluoroscopically, intraarticular fragments are not severely dislocated. It's relatively easy to reduce these fragments using joystick, telegram clamping, and pushing up technique from intermediary canal. And the arthroscopy, after reduction, BLP is securely fixed. This is a 43-year-old male C3 fracture with central depression fragment at the scaphoid fossa. Uh, this is a video and then this is a fragment. So uh, now I'm trying to push up uh, from intermediary. The upper is the radial side and the lower is the ulnar side. Now, uh, almost reduced. But here, we can still see the step off. So I inserted the KYF from the other side 
to do joystick maneuver. And now I've got the reduction like this. The K wire, a temporary fixed fragment, was removed two weeks after surgery. The screw in supported this fragment, so I didn't perform bone graft. Six months after surgery, when the plate was removed, we tried second look uh, for articular surface. Regeneration with fibro cartridge at the gap was observed without any step off. One year after surgery, mayor and dash score were perfect. Uh, today's theme is how to manage DRUG instability associated with DRF. Before discussing this theme, I investigate the frequency of TFCC injury associated with DRF in my cases. This is the background. I performed part for over 600 risks so far. Average age was 63, including few high-level athletes. About 80% of the risks were intraarticular fracture, and C3 was mostly involved. Uh, this is a late end pattern of TFCC injury according to our original classification. We could see it in 440 lists, it was almost 70%. But these were including certain amount of degenerative tear. Traumatic tear was 47.5%. Sweet tear at the disc is the most common. And the peripheral aversion from the uh, ulnar steroid was the next common. Phobia tear without ulnar slide fracture was very few, only eight cases. How to di diagnose DRG instability? Pre-operative X-ray and CT are often useful. Ulnar head development test under general anesthesia is essential, and DRG arthroscopy is a definitive procedure. DRG expansion and small fragment phobia on the X-ray indicate DRG instability, and ulnar styroid base fracture is also the predominant finding of DRG instability. CT is useful to detect DRG location, dislocation. Ulnar head development test is quite useful and essential to detect DRG instability. I try ulnar head development test after fixing DRF. It's necessary to compare instability with that of the contralateral side. Video shows a typical case of DRG instability before and after the repair. And hook test and floating sign in radiocarpal arthroscopy are effective to diagnose. However, DRG arthroscopy is a definitive procedure to diagnose TFCC phobia tear. 1.9 small scope is suitable to see the phobia region, like this. The necessity of simultaneous treatment for associated TFCC phobia injury is still controversial. In the clinic, young and active patients are basically indicated. This is an 18-year-old man. He had bilateral DRF, uh, left side was C3, and the right side was C1, associated with TFCC phobia tear we could recognize TFCC complete tear through DRG arthroscopy. I carried out arthroscopic transcessus repair reported by Toshi Nakamura. Two loop sutures passed through the bone tunnels are retrieved through the 4-5 portal, and TFCC is tightly attached to the phobia with tying up the thread. These are photos after repair. TFCC phobia region is completely repaired. Three months after surgery, Rome of the list was almost normal. He achieved full functional recovery. Six months uh, when plate was removed, we could see normal tension of TFCC and healthy ligament arthrophobia. However, we performed simultaneous TFCC phobia repair only five lists. It's 0.8%. I think this is probably because almost patients we have treated were ordinary people, not high athletes, and their average age was 63 years old. Ulnar steroid fracture, especially base fracture, could lead to DRG instability if it includes TFCC phobia region. In that case, we need to fix this fracture. This is a student of military self-defense. She underwent OLIF using VLP for DRF. 
but Arnstein's base fracture was ignored. She visited our clinic with slack sensation of the wrist and the weakness of grip strength four months after the operation. Ulnar head development test showed gross instability of the ulnar head. Ulnar head instability remained after tension band wiring of the ulnar styroid. Therefore, I carried out transcessus repair. After repair, ulnar head instability disappeared. She could return military school without any deficit four months after surgery. This is a strategy for DRG instability associated with DRF. After fixing DRF, ulnar styroid fracture should be fixed when DRG instability is recognized. DRG instability still exists after fixing ulnar fracture. TFCC phobia tears should be investigated and treated. Gross DRG instability without ulnar styroid fracture indicates TFCC phobia injury. In that case, TFCC phobia repair should be considered. These strategies should be indicated to young and active patients. Conclusion. Wrist arthroscopy, especially DRG arthroscopy, is a definitive procedure to diagnose TFCC phobia tear. Arthroscopic transcessus repair is less invasive and effective procedure to treat this condition. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abe, for the nice presentation. Uh, now we open this two topics for the question and answer. So far, I, I haven't found uh, any question from the audience. So I'd like to uh, ask a question myself to Dr. Bindra. Uh, in the first case, uh, you just uh, repair the radial side. It's a carpal dislocation uh, case. So what about the honor side? What, what did you do for the honor side to stabilize the wrist? So uh, the, it's a radiocarpal dislocation. So it needs repair of the short and long radiolunate ligaments. So by repairing the styloid and repairing the short, the radiocarpal joint became stable. Now the distal ulna, if you look at that case, the distal radio ulna joint remains stable. The ulnocarpal joint does not need stabilizing because once you stabilize the radiocarpal joint, that stabilizes the whole thing. So the radius and ulna did not need stabilizing. And the ulnocarpal ligaments, uh, they heal themselves. And that's why he was put in a cast for four weeks uh, post-operatively, and that's generally adequate. Okay. So you know the whether we should repair TFCC uh, acutely or not is a, a huge matter of debate. Uh, so it's uh, very surprising uh, that the uh, doctor- I'm, I'm sorry, I'd like to uh, I'd like mm -hmm. ask, ask about- Please, Dr. Abe, please, oh, for the comments. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask, ask a question to uh, Professor Binder and uh, about the first case. You repair uh, borer side of the small fragment to uh, how to repair the borer uh, out of the fragment. You, uh, you use a, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you repair borer side of the ligament to deattach the radius? Correct. So in this case, the volar, the ulnar injury on the radial uh, ulnar corner was purely ligamentous avulsion. Mm -hmm. There was a piece of cartilage, which was the lunate facet of the radius. Mm -hmm. That cartilage was ejected. So I replaced the cartilage back in Okay. And when you reduce the radius, the cartilage piece sat back in place. There was no need for fixation of the cartilage fragment, mm -hmm. but the, the volar ligament, the short radiolunate ligament, okay. was reattached back to the radius by bone anchors. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Correct. Okay. So we all agree that the volar lunate facet fragment is very important to prevent the dislocation of the carpus. Uh, what's your thoughts on the best uh, fixation uh, device? To, for this tiny fragment. Dr. Abe, please. Now we have uh, several plates to fix such a small fragment uh, from uh, uh, aptus or... Uh, like a hook plate? Yeah. yeah, yes, right, right. Okay. But, uh, however, even a small fragment, uh, such a uh, plate is not useful. So at mm -hmm. that time, I use, uh, like like a Professor uh, Bindura, I, stitch uh, borer side of the fragment 
the border side of the ligament to reattach the radius. Dr. Bindra, what's your thoughts on that? I, I agree. You know, it doesn't matter what you use. I have used two millimeter hand plates cut mm -hmm. and put into hooks. Yeah, yeah. You can use a K wire and uh, put a screw on the K wire to stop it from migrating. I think you can use anything. It all depends on the size of the fragment. The one lesson I've learned is that when there is polytrauma and their lower limbs are injured, and we see a lot of that because I work in a trauma hospital, that no matter how you fix it, they can displace late. So I have now got a lower threshold for putting a wrist spanning plate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, because of shortage of time, I couldn't get across, but I want to stress that if you put a plate across the wrist, take it out two or three months later, you still don't lose wrist motion, it's surprising, but it's very useful in some of these severe injuries to protect your fixation and the patient can be allowed to use crutches and mobilize, uh, so certainly, Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. Uh, now we got a, a question from uh, Esther Chow. Uh, scaphalunate dis dissociation is commonly associated with intraarticular distal radius fracture. How do you diagnose SL injury and what is your preferred treatment? Dr. Abe, please. Yeah, I usually use a lysoscopy so I can see a SL ligament through arthroscopy. And uh, uh, according to the Geisler's classification, a grade three or four, or such a gross instability between the SL, we can see uh, about the ten percent. However, uh, we need to uh, fix uh, such a ligament injury for young and active patients. It's not so uh, frequently, I think. Okay, uh, can you uh, tell us uh, your thoughts on? Uh, combined scaphalonate injury, Dr. Bindra. Mm -hmm. Combined scaphalonate yeah, yeah, injury yeah. and the distal radius. How do you manage it? Yeah, yeah thank you. Like, like my colleague, Dr. Abe, I don't scope all wrists, right? <laughs> so the majority of my distal radius fractures simply get a polar plate. The ones that I will scope are if they have a chauffeur type fracture or if the fracture line exits through the scaphalonate joint or mm -hmm. if there's uneven depression of the, of the scaphoid facet versus the lunate facet. So if I'm concerned that there is a ligament injury, I will scope it. Uh, and if I do confirm the injury, so for a grade three, that means the ligament is intact but stretched, I'll simply do a percutaneous pinning. But when I do the arthroscopy, if there is a complete tear of the ligament, I will do an acute repair along with fixation of the radius fracture and put some pins. And then I remove the K wires after eight weeks and mobilize. But yeah, I, I would say less than 5% of the time do I need to repair a scaphalonate ligament. Okay, yeah, it's not I, that I, frequent. I agree. Okay, so there's another question from uh, Greg Bain uh, from Australia. Uh, there is a very few forbear aversion, but there are basal fractures that cause instability. Dr. Abe, do you mm -hmm. think that other cause of instability is the vola or dorsal rim? is associated with the instability? I think it's very rare, especially a radius, a TFCC of the radial side, it's detached uh, very free, uh, very few. So uh, almost all the cases, uh, it shows the DRG instability is the phobia tear. Okay, but uh, you said uh, it's, it's not quite frequent. You said it's less than 1%. I was so surprised. Yes, right, right, right. right. <laughs> But I thought it would be like a 40% of the TFC would be the forebear tear. So what's your thoughts on that? I think almost all the cases there uh, instability shows with the uh, combined ulnar side fracture. Uh -huh. So uh, if uh, ulnar, uh, we fix the ulnar side fracture, uh, the instability disappeared in, in almost cases. Okay, uh, we got another question from Margaret Falk. Uh, in case where there is a ulnar styloid fracture, we can differentiate whether the TFC tear is attached to the ulnar styloid or not by arthroscopy. Uh, at first, <laughs> I fix the uh, ulnar styloid fracture. Mm -hmm. So, mm, I, I told you before, almost all the cases of the 
such a, a patient, uh, the RJ instability is gone. Oh, really? Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. However, but... uh, after fixing the unstable fracture, still uh, the RJ uh, instability exists. We need to investigate TFC phobia. Okay. Uh, I, I like to ask a question myself. For myself, it's uh, very difficult to differentiate uh, the instability, a test uh, DLJ instability interoperatively mm -hmm. when uh, everything is opened up. Uh, although there's uh, distal radius is fixed, still PQ is released. Uh, so in my case, I think it's very hard to differentiate interoperatively. Mm. Uh... So, in my clinic, uh, I, oh, I perform a surgery almost under general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, relatively easy to understand the DLJ instability uh, compared to the contralateral side, especially okay. at the point of the general anesthesia. Okay. Uh, can, what's your thoughts on that, I, Dr. Bindra? I, yeah. what, what I tend to do after I fix the radius, you're right, when the radius is open, it's very hard to assess. So once I fix the radius, like most people, I would check the instability. And if it feels grossly unstable, I, I'm quite tolerant of what I mean by, it has to be quite unstable. And very occasionally, I will go across to the other side, wake up the anesthetist and feel the other arm. Okay. The other gloves and uh, make sure, you know, check it. Uh, but what I like to do is put a K wire in the styloid, in the ulnar styloid. And if that reduces uh, or restores stability, I will fix the ulnar styloid. If okay. putting a wire in it does not restore the stability, then as Margaret pointed out, it's likely an avulsion of the TFC itself, right? It's not mm -hmm. attached to the base fragment. So then I will do an open repair and I do not worry about the ulna styloid. I simply put an anchor into the fovea. Uh, so I use a knotless anchor. So I put two rows of stitches into the peripheral edge of the TFC and using knotless anchors, I put it into the floor where the styloid would be going. So I have no room left for fixing the styloid. So I ignore the styloid fragment itself. Okay, so how often do you do to fix the TFCC among the distal radius fracture? It would be again, the very low percentage. Okay. okay. Again, less than 5% of the time. Uh -huh. You know, if, if I'm slightly suspicious that it's a little bit looser than the other side, if I put them in supination for the first three weeks, that seems to work quite fine as well. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, we also have uh, a question from Michael Sando. Uh, osteoarthritis following a distal radius fracture fixation is reported at 30 to 40%. Does this reflect inadequate reduction or is it mainly articular surface trauma and can confirm a confirmation of adequate reduction be confirmed with imaging alone or even in simple cases. Uh, Dr. Abeg, can you tell us your thoughts? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh... Uh, arthritis uh, will mm -hmm. uh, following about 30 to 40 percent. Is it caused by inadequate reduction or articular okay, fracture okay. itself? Uh, I had uh, I've had a very rare rare case uh, in such uh, osteoarthritis after the DRG, uh, as after dislocated fracture, because uh, I usually try to uh, fix uh, joint surface using a wrist arthroscopy. So 30 or 40 percent is very, uh, very frequent, I think. Okay. I think uh, he's Dr. Dr. To, uh, probably radio. He's probably, Dr. Sandow is probably referring to radiographic osteoarthritis, not symptomatic osteoarthritis of the distal radius, because we don't, 40% of our patients with wrist arthritis don't have distal radius fractures, right? Most of the wrist arthritis that I see are from slack wrist or similar mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. So I think he is referring probably to post, uh, to radiographic changes. Now I don't scope all, so I don't know, but I, I don't, I, I believe like any joint articular reduction, what you see on x-ray, is often less than what you see uh, when you're doing the arthroscopy, especially because arthroscopy is so magnified that everything looks much worse than when you do with the x-ray. But uh, I think uh, in my hands, getting a good reduction in the majority of cases seems to be adequate uh, without arthroscopy. And I don't think that it's changing the incidence of symptomatic osteoarthritis, maybe radiographic. 
Dr. Feng, would you proceed the question? Oh yeah, I want to ask. Yourself. Yes, yes. Um, yes, to both experts, the uh, instability and symptomatology of DRUJ instability uh, problems they don't correlate. Patients with unstable distal radial joint does not necessarily have symptoms. Those who have symptoms does not necessarily have an unstable joint. They can have a stable joint. Well, so I don't know how to prevent that in an acute scenario. You can, can always come back later. What are your in, insights on this in the acute situation, number one? Secondly, in the chronic situation? Okay. Uh, we got another question to Dr. Abe. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in what percentage do you do wrist arthroscope for the intra-articular distal radius fracture? Yeah, I think uh, uh, arthroscopy is needed to, uh, not, uh, to evaluate not only in the joint surface, but also soft tissue injury. So basically, I have done uh, wrist arthroscopy for almost all the cases. However, okay. uh, the elderly patient or inactive patient, I, I don't uh, use a resources copy. Okay. Uh, oh, can no. you answer my chronic versus acute question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, Abe and, and Binger. Mm, I'm sorry? Chronic? So how do you decide who will become problematic later and who do you need to treat? Ah, it's a very difficult question, I yeah. think. But, uh, basically uh, young uh, uh, for example 20 or 30 years old and uh, high level athletes like a tennis player uh, or so so uh, i i want i prefer to uh, fix uh, tfcc uh, simultaneously but I, I i don't know it's uh, it's uh, definitely needed or not so if she is old and unstable Slightly unstable, you just leave it. You don't want to repair. Uh, I, I don't fix. Okay. How about for uh, Randy? Yeah, I don't, I, like I said before, I don't have a high threshold to fix all ones that are loose, right? I'll leave them in a supination position for a few weeks and I'll let, let them settle down because I believe a lot of them are asymptomatic. And you can't predict, right, Christian? You can't predict who's going to be symptomatic or not. A lot depends on their activity level as Dr. Abe said, uh, or what work they do, the carpenters, and a lot of twisting movements, et cetera. And uh, uh, yeah, I would deal with it later if it becomes symptomatic, for sure. And this follow-up question now, let's say three months, six months down the line, you have a lady, scenario one, she is unstable and symptomatic. Scenario two, she is stable, but symptomatic. How do you deal with these two patients differently? So if they're stable, in my mind, if they're stable but symptomatic, that pain is coming from somewhere else. It's ECU tendonitis or unlocarpal abutment or something like that. The steroid injection is the best cure for those people and time. Steroid injection and time, and I'm going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to okay. try to delay as long as possible. If they're unstable, and it clearly seems to be that, again, after I feel that they're fully rehabilitated, so they're not stiff, they can be ready for another operation, I'd probably wait about six months before I would then proceed and I would get some more imaging like an MRI scan, but then I would proceed with an arthroscopy and then do a TFC repair plus minus ulna shortening, whatever is needed. Yeah. Okay, there is another question to Dr. Bindra. Excellent results of the revision case of the medial uh, intraarticular depression. Huh? I want to know what is the best timing of revision and there, is there any time limit to do the revision? You know, the problem in that case and in any case is <clears throat> when the joint surface is depressed, you know you want to restore it as quickly as possible. So it doesn't matter. It's whenever they present to me. If they present it at three weeks, six weeks, I'd probably do it. If they are starting to get radiocarpal arthritis, then obviously you would have to decide whether you want to do it or do radiocarpal fusion, right? So I would probably do it within the first three months or so. After that, I would probably have a lower threshold of not to do it because they're probably starting to get arthritis. And as, as far as the consideration of what you put in the gap, I don't think it matters. In a young, healthy person, I just need something to hold the articular surface up. 
So I think calcium phosphate is as good as anything. It's stronger than bone graft. It's cheaper. You don't have to open up the iliac crest in that regard. So I tend to use bone substitutes more often than bone graft simply because it's easy and it's stronger. Okay, good. Uh, can I ask well, a quick uh -huh. question? For yes, Dr. Fair, go ahead. Uh, now you have an open joint here repairing the owner. You find the TFC torn. What's your quick and dirty way of repairing the TFCC quickly to the owner bone? Uh, what's your preference, each of you? Uh, Abe, maybe. Open? Open procedure? Yes, open yeah. repair. How do you do it? Uh, I, I never never had uh, open repair of the TFCC. <laughs> so you go back to an arthroscopy, <laughs> even if you have a distal ulnar fracture. <laughs> How about Bendra? Uh, I, I, I'm similar with the Professor uh, uh, Bindra that I, I probably I, uh, insert the uh, anchor to the phobia and uh, tire uh, peripheral edge of the TFCC, probably. I see. Oh, yeah, wow. I would put anchors, but I guess if there is a fracture of the ulna and I could make some drill holes through it because it's hard oh, to yeah. put anchor. I would put some drill holes through and uh, and pull the sutures through and then put my plate on the ulna and then tie my sutures around the plate or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if there is any more question, I think it's time's up and uh, let me uh, wrap up this session. And uh, congratulations uh, on your uh, to excellent speakers and actively participating uh, audiences. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to send this to Ino for the closing remarks. Thank you, Professor Lee and Dr. Mm -hmm. Fang. It was a wonderful organization. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say uh, thank you to all those participants who joined this uh, webinar today. And thank you all the speakers and moderators for wonderful lecture and wonderful discussion. Today was a very special webinar because we had a combined meeting between a hand and upper limb and trauma surgeon. I personally learned a lot because this is a, a different, uh, because the trauma surgeons have a different background, different way of thinking and different approach, which might I can uh, reflect my clinical practice in the future. I believe learning is a kind of process we need to evolve. We need to keep evolving every day by learning all different resources. So before I close, I would like to invite Dr. Anup Agrawal from APOA trauma section so that he can leave the closing remark. Dr. Anup Agrawal, please over to you. Okay, uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, before you, uh, uh, before you leave this webinar, you need to have uh, your own uh, QR uh, post survey QR code, uh, then we can provide you uh, the certificate. So please uh, click this uh, post survey webinar so that we can improve our webinar in the next time. Do we have uh, Dr. Anup Agrawal ready? Okay, uh, then the, we would like to close this uh, webinar today and thank you very much for your joining and thank you for all uh, your effort and time. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have all questions answered already. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. It's okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. All right. Thanks a lot. Excellent conduction. Thanks a lot. Thank you, all the moderators on the back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Wij waren professor in Hoorn. Thank you.